the books are widely available available in the United States. Well, you can get them in the popular bookstores like Strand Books or Barnes and Noble. Uh, so there are special sections, uh, large sections uh, uh, of, of, of uh, picture books. Sometimes, you know, there are separate sections devoted to African-American children's literature. Well, some of the books are also the publication of famous American museums. Like you can find a large collection of these books in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, yeah, some of these books are, are published by MoMA Publishing House. So this is interesting that, you know, they also find their place in the centers of American art. Okay, so here you can see the main themes of African-American picture books. So first of all, um, well, I'm going to show you some examples of uh, picture books focusing on everything. So first of all, it's fostering self-love and self-esteem, promoting the belief that being black is fine. So you will find a lot of stories about the skin of the the color of the skin or about uh, afro hair these are all very positive images okay of blackness very encouraging uh, another uh, uh, group of picture books focuses on black heritage history and heroes so there are lots of um, biographical books about uh, some black heroes from the slavery time uh, from the civil rights movement up to the present times, like here you can see a biographical picture book about the life and career of Barack Obama. Uh, black artists and musicians. So uh, there's a wide range of picture books that tell the stories of famous African-American artists. Uh, like here you can see the story of uh, Jacob Lawrence, well, in fact, this is a publication of the Museum of Modern Art. It's a beautiful picture book with the illustrations uh, uh, by um, uh, famous African-American artists. Uh, and here below, you can see a few stories of black musicians. Uh, well, these are not only classical musicians like Duke Ellington, a jazz man, but also, you know, there is a book about hip hop music. So you will find all types of books celebrating black art and music. Uh, social and political protest. This is a very popular theme of uh, African-American picture books, and it is strictly connected with this rhetoric of resistance. Uh, you can see young black people participating in protests, demanding equal rights or responding to some changes um, taking place in the country. Uh, well, it's not only about the historical protests. Uh, there is a new, uh, well, uh, group. Well, we, we can say uh, lots of new titles have recently been published in connection with the movement Black Lives Matter. Uh, well, which also incorporate this rhetoric of resistance. Well, this time this is resistance to police brutality and the unequal treatment of black people in the United States. Well, these books are also referred to as own voices literature, as they are written usually by people who experienced racial discrimination in their own lives. So these are these authors draw on their own experience uh, rather than um, being observers uh, to the story of racism. So they provide lots of cultural nuances uh, from um, black communities. Well, African-American picture books are often set in urban spaces, and this is all very interesting uh, that many authors and illustrators, you know, present uh, real locations, uh, I mean, black communities or um, imagined locations. And I would like to focus on two famous locations that are very popular settings for African-American picture books. One of them is Harlem. It's the black community in New York City. Uh, in Upper Manhattan, well, there are lots of stories that focus on the historical times, on the Harlem Renaissance period of the early 20th century. But for this presentation, I've selected the story by uh, Brian Collier, who is both an author and illustrator of the book. It's called Uptown, and this is a celebration of everyday life in Harlem, uh, while promoting the belief that this is still the center of black culture, so there are lots of interesting images of famous locations in Harlem. 
the office says that Harlem uptown, you know, by I mean the Harlem uptown is jazz. So you can see jazz clubs, you can see black churches, you can see barber shops, or you can see the uh, busy atmosphere in the in the street. So this is a wonderful portrayal of uh, African American culture and the vibe of the neighborhood um, that used to be the center of black culture. And this is, well, actually, uh, it's it's still a kind of a celebration of this place. And another location that is becoming a popular setting of many African-American picture books is South Bronx, that is another Black community. Uh, well, this is the center of music, especially hip hop music. And uh, again, when you analyze the illustrations, except for the simple narrative, you can learn a lot about Black creativity about the willingness of young characters uh, to promote their own culture and to influence other people uh, with their uh, fresh ideas about black music and culture so uh, looking at all of these uh, picture books uh, well i guess you will what you will notice over there is the element of black joy uh, black joy is like you know celebration of being black enjoying yourself as being black and, and so on. Well, actually, um, the, the concept of Black Joy uh, was, uh, well, actually, uh, it appeared in African-American uh, picture books uh, because many authors were influenced by uh, Black Joy movement uh, that was started by African-American journalist Cleaver Cruz in 2017. So it's a kind of a new cultural uh, phenomenon. And uh, well, actually, Cleaver Cruz says uh, that uh, when we talk about blackness in America, we cannot only focus on the pain connected with the past, but we also have to focus on joy. And these two things can be combined. Well, let me quote him. He says, black joy is healing, resistance and regeneration. Uh, so summing up, I would like to return and come back to the topic of my presentation, African-American picture books and the rhetoric of resistance. So what kind of resistance can you find in these stories? Well, first of all, the, the stories give voice to those who are historically silenced. So the young characters are usually the narrators of the stories. They are, they are the main characters who focus on Black life from a positive perspective. Well, the books respond to recent events affecting black men and women. So they uh, protest against social inequalities uh, that are still present in the United States. They celebrate black people's resilience and perseverance in the face of many problems. They reverse stereotypes about black people. They celebrate black people's achievements, uh, focusing on the stories of famous African-Americans. And finally, they try to imagine what it is to be black beyond systemic racism. Uh, I guess picture books, African-American picture books uh, can be used as a good resource to study American culture, specifically African-American culture. Uh, you can use picture books in your English language lessons as you know they are usually the narratives are very simple and the they can be like good material to discuss different things um okay in english i, I i'm not sure if the books are available in your countries of course you can get them online uh, but there is one more thing i'd like to tell you uh well on netflix there is a series called bookmarks um i'm not sure if this is available in your countries well in poland it is and here you can see a few episodes with African-American authors reading their own stories from the picture books. So this is very entertaining, but also very, very informative. OK, so thank you. That, that is all I wanted to tell you. And I really encourage you to, to read African-American picture books. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, full of information. Uh, you are presenting a very colorful landscape of uh, black American uh, picture books. Well, uh, we have plenty of questions uh, okay. relating to your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have two other uh, presentations and then we'll have a general discussion. We'll come back to you with a question. Uh, okay. With your patience, please remain with us till the end. Thank you very much. Thank so you. See you after 
40 yeah. minutes hopefully okay thank you uh, the next speaker The next speaker is uh, Dr. Wacha Apadu Ramsamsi from Mauritian uh, University. Are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Good to, to hear you because we don't see you. Well, okay. Good to see okay. you. We, here you are. So we have some technical problems. Uh, welcome to this uh, series of online lectures about uh, well, the topic today is the Black American, and uh, and uh, your uh, your uh, presentation is entitled "The Evolution of Black American Identity in Pop Culture." Very interesting topic. Uh, probably uh, it can be uh, another approach to the previous speech about the picture books. Yours is uh, about the adult world the wicked adult world, not with the innocent one. Hopefully, uh, we'll hear different approaches and deeper uh, analysis of this picture of bl uh, Black American, uh, African American literature. Uh, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes to give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mediti. Good evening from Mauritius. So I'm Dr. Wedsha Ramsami from the European University of Mauritius and the Mauritius Institute of Education. Um, my topic for today's presentation is the evolution of Black American identity in pop culture. I think I should start by explaining why I've chosen this topic. Well, there are so many works on the underrepresentation um, marginalization and stereotyping of Black Americans in pop culture. And uh, post-2020, there has even been an increasing demand uh, for Black American-centered movies on streaming platforms such as Netflix, as those movies serve as informative or provide historical glimpses for viewers who want to know more about Black American identity in the United States. But um, often emphasizing too much on these mediatized images of victimization or caricatured images of servitude, uh, we tend to move away from the bigger picture. That is, things have changed. Evolution is real. What I want to highlight in today's presentation is that the Black American identity is one that is evolving. And I wish to narrow down for today to this positive evolution made possible through popular culture. Um, to use an analogy, when I teach feminism, I often tell my students, we cannot say that feminism is a complete success in the 21st century, as the aim is to have all homo sapiens independent of their gender, treated as equals and respected. Um, consequently, gender identity or female identity is one that is fluid and undergoing a transformation process. Now, I would say the same logic applies to Black American identity. Evolution is fluid and is never complete. So let's chart this evolution in pop culture. First of all, we are contextualizing this debate in a country where once upon a time Darwinian pyramid of race was the dominant discourse. And a free people, free black people, were once constitutionalized as free fifth of all of the persons when it comes to political structures and decisions. And nevertheless, the same country powerfully believed and believes that all men are created equal. Now, if we go back in time, more precisely, prior to the 1960s, Black Americans were represented through stereotyped images of musical entertainers, often linked to jazz, servant roles, linked to the concept of servitude associated with slavery, or sports figures. For instance, uh, before the 1960s, uh, Black Americans would often be caricatured as lazy, or on the other extreme through the image of the mammy stereotype as a black African woman whose image would be on mass-produced cans. 
um, stereotype as a loyal domestic worker, a black woman who devotedly and subserviently serves the white Americans, or the famous Uncle Tom caricature, image of the submissive and obedient black man, or through the image of watermelons relating to black Americans' food, or as a symbol of self-sufficiency during that time, this fruit metaphor soon started to be associated with poverty. But uh, the cultural revolution that challenged those stereotypes started mostly in the 60s and 70s with the emergence of the philosophical phrase, black is beautiful. And that was the time when black Americans affirmed themselves beautifully with the Afro hair, um, lyrically with James Brown, catchy lyrics, um, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, or the behavior shift through the well-mannered black doctor and guess who's coming dinner, which, by the way, also deals with the controversial issue of that time, which is intermarriage. Now, that's not only evolution or what we call a transformative process, but also a revolution where Black Americans use the popular culture platforms of that time to bring a change to the ways in which they have been represented. And to quote Tony Brown, Television is on the brink of a revolutionary change, and that was in 1970. Now, popular culture is often defined as a space where popular ideas or dominant ideologies are sustained. But what happens to popular culture when society, politics, and culture go through transformative processes? They automatically, or I would say naturally, respond to the zeitgeist of the time. Actually, the 21st century has been a continuation of this evolutionary process, with Denzel Washington and Halle Berry being the first black nominees who won the Best Actor and Best Actress Academy Awards in 2002. And I know due to time constraint, I'm skipping some centuries and moving to the 21st century. But the point that I'm trying to make is that change is constant. An image of the Black American, the identity of the Black American had to be reconstructed or represented. Um, Post-colonial African literature often highlights the need uh, for Black um, African writers to write back and reconstruct those misrepresented images and identities that have historically been popularized since colonial times. But what popular culture witnessed in the 21st century actually transcends this political need to rewrite Black African identity. One powerful example that binds African descent in the Black American culture and identity is Ryan Coogler's 2018 Black Panther. But let's slow down a little before jumping to an analysis of Black Panther. How did we reach a moment where the dominantly white multiverse of superheroes became ready to transgress stereotype whiteness and blackness? Earlier, I mentioned very briefly a Darwin's theory of race and how historically people have been obsessed with notions of inferiority and superiority when it comes to skin color. And this Darwinian theory was also used to justify slavery at a point. But in 2003, the Human Genome Project compelled the world to question racial beliefs and colorism. And it has been revealed that there's no scientific basis for race. It's a made-up label and that all non-Africans today are descended from a few thousand humans who left Africa maybe 60,000 years ago. And this revelation highlights global diversity, but most importantly, a common thread that binds the world population as one species. Now, along with this post-racist wave in 2009, Barack Obama was elected as the first African-American president. And he became an important trigger that transformed popular culture images at a faster pace. 
Um, his pop culture presence influenced the presentation of perfect Black American family unit as one that focuses on values, respect, and knowledge. Um, it should however be noted that prior to his election in uh, 1972, in The Men, James Earl Jones played the role of a Black American president, but in the movie his position was resisted. Or in 1998, Morgan Freeman played a Black, highly uh, patriotic president in Deep Impact. But the image of the Black president popularized by Barack Obama was the one played by Jamie Foxx in 2013 in White House Down. And in the same year, 2013, Beyonce, popular African-American singer, performed at Obama's presidential inauguration. The 21st century was thus marking a new phase, an era that was called the post-racist era for some time, a moment that recognized and acknowledged that Black American identity was not the one mediatized or mass-produced before the 1960s. But the post-2017 uh, experienced some racial tensions and resentment, and this leads us to Kugler Black Panther in 2018. Uh, why Black Panther? Let me just read this quote on the slide. After the Obama era, perhaps none of this, sorry, none of this should feel groundbreaking, but it does. In the midst of a regressive cultural and political movement, moment, fueled in part by the white nativist movement, the very existence of Black Panther feels like resistance. Its themes challenge institutional bias, its characters take unsettled digs at oppressors, and its narrative includes prismatic perspective. Now, the code written on the slide is from Time Magazine, which has celebrated the movie as one that feels like resistance or one that challenges institutional bias. But why is it my personal choice for today's presentation? Um, well, firstly, superheroes have often been stereotyped, similar to fairy tales, Prince Charming, as having blue eyes, white skin, and sometimes blonde hair, and this makes us think of tall, or rich white representation of capitalism, like Iron Man, or still in the Marvel Universe, through white American patriotism, such as Captain America. But responding to the cultural and political evolution of the 21st century, it was high time to revisit the image of the white superhero. It was high time for one that acknowledges a powerful civilization that existed prior to colonization, one that is depicted in the famous Things Fall Apart by African writer Chino Akebe, or one that embraces the African descent with its traditions, rituals, fashion, and accent, not in a derogatory, or caricatured way, but one that celebrates African knowledge, intellectual capacity, and material abundance. A movie that reflects 1960s phrase and pride, Black is beautiful. In fact, the title itself is very symbolical. Um, the Black Panther Party was founded in 1966 in California, and it was one of the most influential militant Black power organizations that uh, confronted politicians and protected Black citizens from brutality. Um, it was an organization born during the civil rights movement. The Black Panther Party was revolutionary in spirit, and indeed the movie also carries that same wave of revolution. For instance, the identity of um, the Black American woman, as highlighted earlier, was one that was often associated with servitude, serving and being devoted to a white family. Or at times, they have been presented as loud and aggressive. But the 21st century has seen a changing trend in female Black American identities, such as um, Kerry Washington as an intelligent leader of management firm Scandal 2018, or Viola Davis as a successful lawyer in How to Get Away with Murder 2020. Along the same vein, we have Letitia Wright as the technological brain of the Black Panther, and uh, Dana Guerrero as the firm warrior. So, 
stereotypical identities are deconstructed. And we now have a more realistic portrayal of strong black American characters in popular culture. Um, before summing up, I wanted to share these lines from the New York Times with you. They were shared by Kubler, the director of Black Panther, during an interview. So he said, uh, when I was a kid, I refused to eat watermelon in front of white people. To this day, the word itself makes me uncomfortable. Never eat watermelon in front of white teammates. Centuries of demonizing and ridiculing blackness have, in effect, forced black people to abandon what was once sacred. This brings us back to the watermelon stereotype I mentioned earlier. And it is worth noting that pre 1960s stereotypes have created a deep psychological scar that is still surreal in the 21st century. Um, the ways in which popular culture has depicted, is depicting, and will depict American, uh, Black American, will definitely impact their identity. As I said from the beginning, evolution is a process, one which is still in the making. I'm not denying that it is a debatable issue, and uh, some of you would say that Black Americans are still marginalizing pop culture, um, which is, again, another debate. But I would only say that we have to acknowledge that it is a leap in the right direction from the mammy, Uncle Tom, and watermelon stereotypes to Black American directors and actors who are deconstructing and reconstructing those biases into revisited and more real identity. I thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you for this interesting uh, and illuminating uh, presentation about uh, underrepresentation, misrepresentation of uh, Black Americans, African Americans. Some prefer to say African American, but Black American uh, is good, is the right term. Do you agree with me, Doctor? Yeah, thank you. I'm here. Well, uh, Dr. Wacha. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, you can hear me. So uh, we have another uh, presentation and then we'll come back to you with questions for your interesting and we have a plenty of questions about representation, post-colonialism and a lot of issues. Thank you for your uh, presentation again. Uh, now we move to uh, Dr. Pierre Richard Midor uh, in French. I hope I'm pronouncing his name in French, or is it uh, an English, Anglicized? Dr. Pierre. Yeah, I'm here. Thank I'm you. Yes, yeah, so uh, I uh, pronounce your name in a French uh, way or Anglicized way. Richard or Richard? It's okay. Richard, but it's okay. okay. Richard, so Pierre Richard Midor, welcome to this series of online uh, lectures. Uh, you're, uh, you are from uh, University of Chile, uh, Haiti. Uh, your presentation is about Creole and Creolization, uh, the case of Haiti. So Haiti is known for this uh, pigeon uh, language, pigeonization and creolization, hybridization of language. Uh, it seems uh, interesting. The floor is yours. You have 20 minutes to give your presentation. After that, we come to you, come back to you uh, with questions. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Let me try to share first. Um, Sorry. Sorry, one second. Take your time. Creality. Give me one second, sorry. Um. Oh, sorry. 
He doesn't allow me. <laughs> Sorry, give me one second, please. Sorry, I try to. Well, he doesn't follow me. Sorry. Okay, I'm here. You can see it. Can you see my presentation? No, sorry, we can't. Now we can, yes. Now it's working. Uh, okay, thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. Uh, today I'm about to present to you Creole and Creolization, the case of Haiti. First of all, as Mimon said, uh, I'm Pierre Richard from Haiti, but I live in Chile, so I'm part of two different countries at the same time. Um, and today uh, I'm about to tell you a little, a little bit about Haiti and the whole process of creolization because creolization is not only in Haiti, it's part of different other countries and we are going to talk about it. Uh, one of the other we talk about the creolization uh, is Barnabé, Confiant and Chamoiseau who wrote a book that named The Praise of Diversity. And creolity, we cannot uh, forget about diversity because the creolity is a mix uh, or the meeting between European and America and other part of the world, right? So the book of Chamoiseau named uh, Creolity uh, talk about what happened when we talk about creolization in Haiti and Martinica, Guadalupe, Mauritius, uh, Seychelles, uh, Haiti, Dominica, St. Lucia, Guy French Guiana. What do I mean? Creole, we speak it in almost eight countries around the world. And, and we are going to talk about the manifestation of this Creolization and also what uh, is happening in Haiti especially. One of the author of the Creolization in Haiti, one of the first author to write in Creole is Charles Alexis Osvald Dura. Uh, and this guy was born in Haiti in 1840. And he, he wrote one of the book uh, that the first time they, they wrote in, in Creole, his name is Shukun. And with this book, he become famous. And uh, because uh, before this period of time, normally people used to work on in French. By the way, you know Haiti was colonized by the French, so um, it's important also to understand the construction of Haiti. Haiti normally uh, during the process of the colonization, uh, we we are in the Caribbean, right? And the French go first to uh, Africa. And about the triangular trade, I, I don't know if you heard about the triangular trade, but with the triangular trade, the European used to go to Africa to take black people and enslave them and move them to America. In the case that Haiti is one of the first country where European especially reached the continent. So the creation of this country, of the people from this country, we are part of different countries in West Africa, Central of Africa, or South Africa. What do I mean? From the West Africa, like uh, Guinea, Ivory Coast, um, Gabon, um, Cameroon, or if we go to the center of, of it, we can talk about uh, Democratic Republic of Congo until uh, Mozambique, even though Mozambique speak uh, Portuguese, but the construction of the different people who come to Haiti, they are part, they were part of uh, this block of the world. 
So they were coming with their own languages, their own cult culture, and let's think about also the French culture was in Haiti. So the creolization is almost a mix of cultural aspect that we find on the same the same territory. So um, in the 70s, in the 80s also, they, they started a movement named Creolity. Even though uh, we used to talk about Creolity with Osvaldo since 1890, uh, honestly, um, in Haiti and all the Caribbean also, they start to talk about Creolity because they realize it's very important. Um, and one of the case that we can talk about it later is that at the uh, at the beginning of 2012, for example, Haiti tried to uh, take part of the uh, to, to be to become a member of the African Union because even though we are in the Caribbean, we still consider ourselves all part of the African continent. So. Uh, being a Creole is being from everywhere and anywhere at the same time, right? So the Creolization, it was uh, an idea to legitimize another version of the Caribbean identity, taking the formation of Creole and Patois and the area as a paradigm of another cultural identity. Because we are a mix of different cultural aspect of the world of well, starting from the Euro European, the French people, and the a big group of African people who were, were mixed in Haiti and the Caribbean. So um, the creality normally is, we can consider it a different aspect. First of all is uh, to understand that it is important, the cultural aspect that we may find in the country, in Haiti, for example, and is not a simple culture, it's a multiple culture. So we are going to talk about three special definition about Creole. Creole, the first thing is the a language mix. For example, if you take French, you mix it with Spanish. Uh, in that happens, especially in a migration process, you will have a language between. So first of all, Creole means language mix. And the second one, in the case of Haiti, it was about the people who were born in the colony because during the period of the uh, triangular trade, um, some of black people used to come from, from Africa and other black people, descent of the African people were born in the colony of French, which named Saint-Domingue. So they used to call the people who were born in the col colony, they used to call them Creole. And what we are going to talk about also is the language because all languages normally they have a process and in, uh, in order to become a specific language for example the french before uh the french becoming official it came at the beginning from the latin language it came from other languages so uh creole has the same process also but right now, Creole is a language that we can see it, we, that used to be speak, speaking in eight countries around the world. And the Caribbean, where we find uh, five countries, and in Africa, we find uh, almost three countries that we are going to see right now. In the Caribbean, as we have Haiti, Dominica, St. Lucia, Guadeloupe, Martinique, and Guyan, French Guiana. Then in Africa, we may find like Mauritius, Reunion Island, and Seychelles. 
even though they might have some differences, but we still are able to, we still be able to understand what they may express. Here is Mauritius, um, Reunion Island, and what we want to talk about whenever we say creality. Uh, the different thinkers that we have, like Oswald Duran, Chamoiseau, they normally, they start with creality in order to determine and predict uh, what it needs to be done about the culture, about understanding uh, our starting point, about understanding why we are that way. They are not only seek to establish a position of what Creole is, but also to make an opposition about Creole. Because they, whenever other people used to talk about Creolity, they just talk about a mix of languages. But the movement of Creolity is to change the point of view of Creolity, starting by, with the people from this kind of country. Pierre, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, there is a problem apparently with your screen because it appears to be frozen. So can you fi try to fix it? We're only seeing the first slide. Only? Oh my goodness, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, it's okay. Sorry, I didn't notice that. All right, uh, all right, thank you. I start. And now, can you see it again? Can you yes, see it? Yes, 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 we can see it. Thank you. Can you try to move from one slide to another so that we make sure it's working? Yeah. You can see it? No, no it's still uh, on slide number 16, I guess. It can change Creole definition. No, praise of uh, Creolity. But it's okay, you can uh, pursue. And now? No, it's not working. Okay. It's not working. It's not working. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, now, now it's working. We are following you. Please, uh, floor is yours. No, it's working. Okay, sorry. And now you can see it, right? Yes, Seychelles. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, the yes, Seychelles. We can. Okay, so I believe in it. Uh, I, I want to mention that Creolity is, we can consider eight different countries uh, among six in the Caribbean. We only take uh, into consideration Haiti, Dominica, Saint Lucia, Martinica, Guadeloupe, um, French Guyana. And in Africa, we have Mauritius, uh, Reunion Island, and Seychelles. Here you can see Mauritius also, one of the part of the uh, Cre Creole um, movement. And so whenever we talk about Creolity, we means that uh, is that only a mix of language as they used to talk about it at the beginning. Creolity is a process, not only be, uh, between the European people and the Caribbean, but also uh, meeting with the European, the African, and the indigenous people in the Caribbean. So first of all, the movement means to show uh, what is creality in opposition of what others may try to explain about the process without understanding it. So, um, one of the, the book of Chamoiseau, Praise of Creolity, uh, used to uh, take into consideration all the process that happened during the uh, colonization. First of all, we have uh, a mix of different culture, uh, culture, the European culture with African culture and the Caribbean culture. And, but also we have a dependence between between all of them. It's not only European or African, but also what we may find in the indigenous people also. 
So in the case of Haiti, what we can notice, which is one of the biggest country who speak, where they speak Creole, um, Haiti has a specificity in this because by being one of the first country to try to take into consideration the Creole as an official language and try where we find also different authors who talk about the movement. Um, in the Caribbean, at the beginning, they used to talk about Creole as an exotism. What does that mean? Uh, it used to be about the West. All the West people used to talk about uh, the Caribbean. But we try to defer this um, situation by um, valuing the reality that happened in the same country and where we find uh, the big or uh, the main discussion about the process in the Caribbean. When you talk about the Caribbean, we have two different things. First of all, we talk about the island that we may find and also the, so the northern part of the uh, South America, like Venezuela, like French Guiana, like Guyana or Suriname, or the northern part of it, we can say it's part of the Caribbean. So Creolity, as we can notice, uh, from Fanon is uh, the identity that was made in, in a self dignation, denigration at the beginning, but right now it's, tr it's the way to try to build a new recognition about how we are. It's not only the Frenchization of a language, but a way of thinking of different people on the country is a self-acceptance of uh, the cultural heritage that we can receive. Is a movement also, is a revolutionary movement that changed the perspective of uh, the mix of different cultural culture that we may find in the Caribbean and also in the African countries such as Seychelles, Mauritius, or Reunion Island. So Creolity is the cultural cement between the European, in this case, the French people and the African and the Caribbean, but that has also all the aspects that happened during the triangular trade, um, during three, almost 300 years. So in this uh, movement, we may find a presence of different languages, different aspect, different cultural aspect like of syncretism, influence cultural regulation and uh, a way of understanding the reality of different aspects of the person who live on, on the country. So those elements are very important when we, we talk about realization. It's not only the people in the Caribbean, but it's the elimination of the native population that were born in, in the Caribbean. For example, in Haiti, before the colonization process, we used to have uh, the Awarak people who were living in there, the native people, right? So during this process uh, in Haiti, we don't have nowadays uh, the native people in the country because during the, the process of colonization, they were eliminated in the, in the country. And the other thing is the plantation economy and the consequence of slavery. Because in this country, we can make a big difference what happened in Haiti and what happened in Dominican Republic. In Haiti, normally during the colonization, the French didn't want at the beginning, just to say that, uh, to mix their culture with the African who came in the country. So 
that's why Haiti is one, as they used to say, one of the first black country in the world, because um, we, the type of economy that applied during the colonization, it was just to exploit all the resources that were in the, in the country. And the other thing is the ethnic plurality, because we have people from West Africa, from Central of Africa, from the South of Africa. So we have a plurality culture, culture and the same blood. For example, if you go to Mali, you may find people, even though they have different culture, but you may find uh, a way that they might have the same thought, the same way of thinking in the, the country. But if you go to Mozambique, the cultural aspect will be very different from what we may find in, uh, in Mali. But in Haiti, we have all this diversity in the same territory. And we may consider those three elements to talk about creality or creolization. First, the ancient world, when we take into consideration what happened in the Caribbean. And the second one, when we take what happened also in the other part of the world, like Africa, like the other countries, uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, and Reunion. So uh, what is the main thing about creolity and creolization is to understand that we are diverse at the same time we are unique. Uh, we are diverse because our origin is from all over the world. We are everything at the same time and we, we are from from different identity of the mix of different culture of West Africa, Central of Africa, or South Africa with the French people. And uh, another thing I might say in Creole that you might understand in Haiti, we say, Sawea Sesa, Sopawea Sesa Mem. What you see, it is. What you don't see, it's more important than what you may see. I don't know if you <laughs> understand what, what I mean. The in creolity, most of the thing that you may understand by the physical aspect, maybe oh, twenty percent of what is really the reality of the the person. So the creole world stop and be an exotic and begin to be called diverse. So we have different culture and uh, little territory and a little aspect, which is Haiti. And we, we have the Creole as one of the cement of uh, the world population that live in this territory, even though we have other languages like French. And I think the same situation happened to Seychelles to Mauritius, to uh, Guyana, where we have different languages, at least two languages in the same territory. So creolity is a movement that try to consider ourselves different from what the rest may consider. Sorry for, to interrupt you. Uh, you bypassed the limit of time. Can you jump to the conclusion, please? Okay. Sorry. Thank Sorry. Okay. But what what I want to let you know is that um, the creolization is a process where we find. In, in the case of Haiti, a uh, multicultural aspect that is very important to take into consideration when we have to make 
any program that can help to understand what happened in the country. In the education program, we should take into, con into consideration the origin of ourselves, the origin of our aspect uh, from the European, African, and the Antillian people. So uh, I, I'd like to finish with the presentation with the word that say Aristide, uh, that creolization is the first psychological reaction of the African upon arriving in Latin America. Umoya Wamaga, that is the spirit of the word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, this interesting presentation where you tackled, well, you tried to cover a number of issues related to creolization. Creolization is not just a linguistic uh, aspect. It's deeper than that, larger than that. That's what I understand from your uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, the space of questions and we'll come back to the three speakers. Uh, with questions, and the floor is yours. We have an audience. Someone wants to, uh, to say something. Naomi, something. Yes. So, someone, someone raised his, uh, someone raised his, uh, their hands. I, I think uh, they want to add something to yeah. say something. Yes. If I'm not wrong. Well, the three speakers. So, Eva. I think Nabayupa Shiota raised her hands. So if she if she wants to uh, to comment. No, on we can proceed. We can proceed. Then. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have an audience. Of uh, yes. Come here. No, no. Would you come here to speak on the mic? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Well, uh, as far as we know, the American society is uh, highly diversified and uh, hybridized. Uh, the first two speakers speak just about uh, the black case. In the American society, we have the Hispanic, we have the uh, Far Eastern uh, races. I mean uh, by that the Japanese, the Chinese. So why, why didn't we, you take these into consideration and you talk about their cases? Why concentrating only on the black case? Well, this is my question. Well, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, Nitreen uh, also raised her hand. She wants to uh, ask a question, I believe. Yes, yeah. yeah. thank, thank you, you. Khalid. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Eva. I really enjoyed your uh, insightful presentation. And uh, I actually, I'm actually conducting a research project about uh, incorporating uh, critical hip-hop pedagogy in EFL teaching and learning in the context of higher education. And my question is, what are the uh, pedagogical implications um, on incorporating this um, hip-hop as a popular culture within EFL? And can we opt for another pedagogy except for the critical pedagogy in the context of Tunisia? Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, yeah, if I may more, ask now, thank you for this. Eva, doctor, there are more questions. Okay, okay, okay sorry. I have, I have okay. two questions for you. I have two questions for each uh, speaker, if you may. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, your talk is interesting. You spoke about uh, stereotyping and uh, the negativity of representation or misrepresentation, which the uh, African American people uh, experienced it along the last century. Uh, I, I like to go further in the past to the antebellum period, the mid 19th century, uh, before the Civil War. 
and uh, I like to uh, you to comment on uh, the famous and groundbreaking book uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Stowe. Uh, this book tells the story of black families. Uh, does it relate uh, to your topic as a background? Because uh, I like to move to the second point. Uh, you try to. Uh, I, I like you to uh, comment on the examination of the discourse underpinning this marginalization of uh, black uh, people in general, and particularly, particularly in. Uh, picture books and Walt Disney. Thank you. Eva, can you hear me? Now we can't hear you. But you have to unmute your unmute, unmute yourself. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Right. Yes. Yes. I will just add one small question. Mm -hmm. I'm really. Uh, I first of all, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was, it was very uh, insightful and uh, fun. Uh, my question is the following. I really want to know the difference between uh, the genre of picture book and cover book. Uh, is it the same? Do, are there any differences uh, between them? So I'm really can, uh, interested to know. Uh, the Excuse answer. me, uh, the difference between picture books and the other one? Can you? Cover repeat? book. Pardon? Cover book. Cover book. Yes. Okay, so yeah, my thought, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all of these uh, very interesting questions. I'm not able uh, actually to answer all of them, um, you know, yeah, because, you know, I, I'm not familiar with some of the issues you mentioned, but let me try. Uh, well, first of all, there was an issue of uh, other races. Yeah, I was talking only about African-American picture books, but of course there are lots of picture books in America about other racial groups about Latino people. Uh, many of these books are bilingual uh, in English and Spanish. And as far as I know, there is also this rhetoric of resistance. Uh, so there are many stories of immigration, uh, stories of um, assimilation, right? So generally producing, you know, positive images of Latino people. Uh, I know there is a, a growing number of books about American Indians, uh, which are also trying to reverse the existing stereotypes. Uh, but as far as the numbers are concerned, I mean, the number of publications, uh, there are not as many of them as um, African-American picture books. Uh, I would say, uh, well, actually, um, Amongst African American people in the US, there are lots of social activists. Many of them are writers and authors. And I guess the picture books are the result of their social, so called, you know, social and political uh, activism. Uh, so they always represent the issues that are of pressing importance to their community. Yeah, but of course, we can also, you know, because my research, you know, just focuses on African American issues in the US. Uh, so I'm I'm more knowledgeable about African American picture books, yeah. But there are lots of titles about you know other races as well. So that would be my answer to the first question, right? Uh, yeah. Um, then uh, somebody asked me about the uh, educational implications, right, uh, of uh, these picture books. Yeah, there are lots of uh, educational implications. How can they be applied to other cultures? Well, I'm not sure about it. I don't know Tunisian culture. Yes, yeah, so I uh, unfortunately I cannot answer uh, this question, right? Uh, well, uh, the general point here is about giving voice to people who were uh, silenced for a long time. So I guess, you know, even if you um, focus on different ethnicities, I guess the problems might be similar, that some groups are uh, regularly silenced, they are marginalized, they are misrepresented uh, or not represented at all, right? So I guess this rhetoric of resistance uh, uh, can be applied to different cultural backgrounds. Um, yeah, did I answer your question? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, hey. 
actually I wasn't talking about picture books. I were, my question was about uh, hip hop culture, mm -hmm. more specifically about uh, conscious hip hop and seeing mm -hmm. because it's uh, relevant to the uh, critical pedagogy. So. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yes, but I agree about uh, in the context of the media, it can be uh, pertinent mm -hmm. to the case of uh, domination and silencing and misrepresentation. Yeah. Underrepresentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, you know, hip hop has lots of educational implications as well. Okay, it was produced in response to marginalization of black people. Well, it's been 50 years uh, since hip hop was first created in South Bronx. Okay, so. Uh, nowadays, there are lots of uh, materials, lots of uh, articles in the media. I guess you you know, you can find lots of interesting materials about it. And uh, um, I'm not a specialist in on, uh, you know, in hip hop generally. OK, uh, I know there is this rhetoric of resistance that is also um, present in. Uh, yeah, uh, that is, you know, behind one of the motives okay, of hip hop uh, musicians. Right. So they. Uh, well, it's this music is all about giving empowerment to people from marginalized groups. You know, it's about social advancement as well, right? Okay, so yeah, I think there is this kind of implication, certainly, right? Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I, the next question was about uh, Uncle Tom's cabin, right? Uh, and about the image of black families. Uh, for sure, I guess this novel can be used as a background to study uh, contemporary literature. Uh, well, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a uh, very important publication in the mid 19th century. This was, well, it is perceived to be one of the reasons for uh, the beginning of the Civil War. Okay, so it raised people's awareness of. Um, uh, true human values uh, that uh, are present in American families, the values that should be promoted. And it, it was a call for, you know, a kind of humanizing approach to uh, blackness. I guess, you know, contemporary books for children, the picture books I was discussing, are also a call for action. Uh, so uh, the overall aim of the authors and illustrators is to influence the readers with the belief that uh, they can uh, have a better life, that they can, um, uh, well, struggle for equality, they can be successful, and uh, as uh, Langston Hughes said, they can be part of America. So I guess that's the overall message of uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin and contemporary picture books, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, the next question, uh, I guess, was about... Um, uh, marginalization of black people, yes, in picture books and in Disney presentation, D Disney uh, movies, yes. Well, um, may I get some kind of clarification about about this question? Uh, what was the main it's, point it's, here? It's, it's the dominant discourse that marginalizes. Uh -huh. uh, the uh -huh. victimization uh -huh. of black people and the stereotyping, yeah. the othering the process mm -hmm. of othering uh, w w the black people undergo uh, mm -hmm. long history, there is a, a very orthodox, dominant, mm -hmm. hegemonic discourse, uh, you didn't tackle this uh, point, that mm -hmm. marginalizes who dominates Hollywood and who dominates mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. publication industry yeah. to tell us who should publish or should not. Uh -huh. There is an underpinning discourse, the uh, white supremacy and other uh, dominant groups uh, prevail over this uh, landscape of black people and other uh -huh. minorities also. Thank you. Okay, uh, I can see a point now. Yes, definitely. Uh, in American publishing industry, uh, uh, there is, uh, well, this white discourse, you know, is still dominant. Uh, most of the publishing houses are run by uh, white people. And when you, as you look at the numbers of books, you know, published with black or white characters, you can see a lot gap here, which is not proportional uh, to the population of black people in the US, of course. Uh, but I, I hope the situation is changing. 
So as you analyze, you know, picture books published within the last few years, uh, picture books created under the influence of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I guess there is uh, a gradual um, kind of improvement. So uh, black people stop uh, being presented as the victims. Uh, you know, there are lots of stories about, for example, police brutality. And uh, yeah, in many cases, we can see like black, young black people being arrested, but then they find a way to get out of the problem. Uh, they, at the same time, you know, they suffer, but at the same time, they can enjoy their blackness. So there is this element of black joy, which I mentioned. And uh, I guess victimization, it goes, you know, uh, to the second position. So uh, their position as a victim, is not uh yeah is not the most important right uh, well actually uh there is a growing number of uh, picture books uh produced by uh, black people but there are also white illustrators so you know there is the white voice as well and there are more and more people who recognize uh, uh, this problem of othering the problem of white supremacy so they want to change the public discourse uh, yeah, I guess, you know, there is a, there is a lot of progress in that, uh, well, as it's produced within the last few years and picture books, pre, you know, produced like 20 years ago. So definitely there, there's been progress. Thank you, doctor. Maybe another time we can ex expand and uh, think about this issue. Thank you very much. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you for all the questions. We move to, I think Dr. Wecha Aramsami uh, has something to say about the, the, ethnic, the question about other ethnicities in uh, the United States. Uh, sure. And I have a, a question for you and other questions, of course. Uh, we have, yes, we have a question here. Yeah, so uh, my question is, how these books, I mean picture books, evolved over time, and what changes do you observe in the recent publication, either by uh, white Americans or uh, black African American? As for the second presentation for Richa, so how uh, you think that television and movies contributed to the changing narratives of black identity in pop culture? Okay, thank you. I myself have a question uh, for uh, Dr. Weija. Uh, you know that uh, since your, your presentation is concerned with pop culture and you know that, uh, uh, particularly movies, uh, you know that uh, Hollywood lately uh, has been facing a real a big problem of uh, originality when it comes to ideas. So all of the, re uh, of all of the releases we have are actually, you know, uh, somehow recycled ideas, so to speak. So we have only, you know, remakes, spin-offs, sequels, adaptations, and so on. And for instance, the choice of Black Panther, Black Panther in itself is an adaptation from the comic book. So uh, yeah, a Marvel comic book. So uh, I want to see your take on uh, some late uh, controversies uh, regarding uh, the, uh, uh, what's the name? Um, you know, for instance, uh, the TV Cleopatra, Netflix Cleopatra TV series, so uh, which uh, they casted uh, an, uh, a black uh, actress to play Cleopatra, and you know, historically speaking, Cleopatra is actually a white, uh, you know, uh, a white person, also uh, for The Little Mermaid. So it's uh, the uh, Disney did the remake, remake on the cartoon an animated movie Little Mermaid, and they changed the character to a, uh, a black uh, mermaid. You know, so uh, does that really help the case? Does that really help uh, uh, this uh, all-inclusive, uh, you know, uh, way uh, path? Uh, let's say. Um, so I re I'm really interested to know your. Uh, <coughs> take on that. Thank you. We have another question, we have another question here. Okay. Sure. Uh, my question is, I want, uh, I want to know to how extent picture books actually affected the condition of black Americans. Uh, I mean, did they have a real tangible impact on changing the uh, 
conditions of black uh, black American people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, now I think you can answer these questions. Sure. Thank you very much for these very interesting questions, which I believe will allow me to extrapolate on the discussion further. Uh, why did I choose to focus on uh, black Americans uh, instead of the other uh, problematized ethnic identities? Uh, I would say, first of all, it's because I belong to an African country, Mauritius, and I think um, I've been doing a lot of African literature and I can see the connection between African literature and African-American uh, literature and pop culture. But still, I decided to uh, label it Black Americans instead of African-American because to me, I believe we are talking here about a very color conscious landscape and the terminology black makes a whole difference. But at the same time, I believe that um, it's interconnected. Um, be it the civil rights movement or be it uh, the post Pearl Harbor um, yellow peril uh, metaphor and labeling or be it the post 9-11 of uh, a form of racialization. I think that all of them are interconnected in a way or the other. And like um, the previous uh, presenter mentioned, uh, there are always groups that are being silenced and marginalized. And I think we're here using that particular group, but it's also being connected to uh, all the problems, all the uh, dilemma, all the notions of belongingness, uh, the obstacles, the social problems, cultural, political, everything is interconnected. Um, I don't like, you know, pitching um, binaries in terms of superior, inferior, or uh, the powerful and the powerless. But still, we're talking here about a landscape where there has been a silencing mechanism for a very long time. And the moment that someone is non-white, I think that someone, that particular ethnic group has gone through some, um, from historical scars, social scars, and, and such, um, you know, um, difficulties that they have had to uh, cross um, and experience. So that's why the selection of uh, Black American, because I think it's very significant and it applies. It's interconnected to other ethnic groups also. And um, the question about um, Hollywood mo uh, movies recycling ideas at the moment, um, that's a very interesting question. And I was smiling when I heard your question because it's also uh, one question I've tackled in one of my classes on feminism very recently. Now it's true, Black Panther was written in 1966 and it was part of the Fantastic Four, the way uh, Black, uh, Black Panther was introduced. But during that time, he was not given the value that he's given in terms of, you know, um, being connected to his origin in a very uh, proud manner or the celebration of that uh, blackness, of that black skin color, of the tradition, the culture, and so much more, which actually uh, was foregrounded in the movie and not in the comic book back in the 1960s, because that was a different moment in time. And uh, it's true at the moment there are many movies that are being recycled and uh, you gave the example of uh, Cleopatra, which is very controversial, and even uh, Little Mermaid, and I even heard about you know people asking why not a black Barbie. So um, there are at the moment a lot of controversial revamping of uh, movies, of images, of popular images, one of the examples I would use would be, you know, recently, like uh, many female characters are replacing the superheroes. Like if I take the example of Thor, so now we have a female Thor, Iron Man, it's going to be the same and it goes on like that. And the question, is it really working to uh, make someone like Cleopatra who's not supposed to be black, black, or to make Thor now a female Thor, does that really work? 
I think it's debatable, but to me, I believe that sometimes popular culture has a tendency to bring a certain exaggeration at the same time. And uh, instead of, for instance, valuing a woman, um, I would prefer Wonder Woman, for example, who is valued for her femininity rather than having a female tall who is merely, um, you know, a reflection, a mirror image of the male tall. So what is the, the message really behind that? And similarly for Cleopatra or for Little Mermaid. So my point is, um, is that really a celebration of blackness? Is that really um, trying to uh, reconstruct the black image? Or is it merely trying to say, you know, uh, we need uh, ethically to represent some, uh, to have some black or some non-white representation in popular culture, therefore we are merely recycling what we have. So I think it's a huge debate at the, at the moment. Uh, to what extent is it really working? Well, we can have another discussion about that. But uh, you had another question about television and movies that contribute to the changing identities of Black American. I believe uh, to a large extent, yes, uh, because like I said earlier, during the 1960s, there was a changing movement. There was a social transformation that took place. And if not for television, uh, broadcasting those proud black images or broadcasting and celebrating and um, marketing those uh, celebration of blackness, that like black is beautiful, black music, uh, black celebrities, and so much more. I don't think the transformation would have been possible in the way it has been. Because you want it or not, the culture industry is very important in you know, bringing change. Because we are living in a very technologized moment, we live in a digital moment where even if we want to, we cannot move away from what is being represented. So the television, the cinema industry, the music industry has really transformed those stereotypes. Because uh, those images of servitude. So how do you break free from those images, like often we give example of Conrad Hot of Darkness, or even Shakespeare's The Tempest and the presentation of Caliban. So how do we deconstruct those powerful dominant images that have been constructed by a white culture, dominant white culture? So the media, television, movies, etc., does help to change that landscape and to contribute to a more realistic identity, I would say. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Now we will move to Dr. Pierre. I think Dr. Kamel has two questions or to Dr. Pierre. Yes, comment and question. Yes. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Pierre Richard. Uh, you spoke about the encounter between European and natives. This encounter, uh, creolity or creolization, pigeonization, and you uh, insisted on the fact that uh, it's not a linguistic aspect, it's more than that. I'd like to ask you about uh, diversity and difference, the two concepts. And also, I'd like to ask you about the effect of creolization on cultural identity. The effect of creolization on cultural identity. The formation of identity. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, when we talk about creolization, it's not only the linguistic aspect. What do I mean is that only the linguistic aspect. First of all, when we take into consideration the different people who came from Africa, they came with the cultural, the, with their culture. People from West Africa, from Central of Africa, from East Africa, they came with their own culture. But when they reached the colony in this situation during the colonization process, uh, they were supposed to 
try um, not to show their own culture. So what they did, they first of all take into consideration the Catholicism that was in the country because the French were Catholics at the beginning, right? So, so first they mixed the culture with the French culture. And um, it's a way to take into consideration like the spirituality, the spirituality they have at the beginning in their own country and the mix that they do, that they did in the Caribbean, uh, when they reach uh, the, this country. So first of all, we can see a spiritual aspect in the process. And the second part is the mix of the languages. So creolization is what happened also uh, during the process. For example, um, we used to have mixed people from West Africa to the East African countries. Like East African countries, if we can take like Kenya, which is part of the East side. But in case of Haiti, we had people from the Southeast, like um, Mozambique people, yeah? So we have a mix of different culture in the same territory. So creolization is this multicultural uh, meeting that we have in the same place. It's also the language because Creole was born with a mix of French and other languages from African people. So we have at the same time a linguistic aspect and also a cultural aspect because those people also went to the island and they express their spirituality also in another way and it was part of this creolization because if we take just people from west africa they have their own culture right let's take into consideration guinea for example people from guinea they have their culture but is the culture might be very different from from people from Ivory Coast, which is in West Africa, and it might be very different from people from Democratic Republic of Congo. So in Haiti, you have all those mix of culture. So you have a multicultural aspect that come into realization in this territory named Haiti. That, that, that what I, I want to express, first of all. And diversity, well, what do we mean uh, by diversity? Is that everybody, no matter where we are, for example, we take into consideration Haiti, we have people from different origin of West Africa, but at the same time, this diversity make a new identity that we call Haitian. At the beginning, we had different culture because the Haitian people now, we, we're not going to say that we are only West African or we are only South African. We are a mix of those different culture that call Haitian. That, that what I mean. Uh, do I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much for uh, clear, uh, clearly answered. Thank you very much. Well, uh, at the closure of this uh, session, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Eva Sierra, uh, Dr. Wetsch Rabsami, and Dr. Pierre Richard. Thank you very much for your amazing and insightful presentations and see you another occasion thank you very much next week inshallah. okay inshallah okay see you next week thank you very much thank you for the audience thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.